Uh, it's great to be here. I love the concept of the center, of the center for fiction. The Crime Fiction Academy is fantastic. I wish I had something like that when I was starting out. We had to sort of make it up for ourselves, in fact. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was on book tour, and I had one of these classic writer experiences. I got on an airplane to go to my first tour stop, and I saw someone reading a paperback in one of my books. And it turned out I was sitting right behind that guy. So I sat down there, and there he is reading the book. I couldn't stop. I couldn't help it. I said, I kind of stuck my head in between the seats. <laughs> hey, how do you like that book? <laughs> Guy goes, eh. <laughs> I said, well, you're, 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 you're in the first chapter. It really picks up. <laughs> you know, so, so let's face it. We're not in this for the glory necessarily. We're in this because we like telling stories. Um, I grew up in a family of five kids, and what I did was I used to write stories for my brothers and sisters. Uh, my youngest brother, Henry, uh, who was six years younger than me, had this strange phobia called trichophobia. He was afraid of hair, and disgusted by hair, and afraid of finding it in his food and that sort of thing. It's an unusual phobia. So I wrote a little story for him <laughs> about this little boy who lives in a house that turns turns into hair. <laughs> then he realizes he's sitting on the toilet, and the toilet is all hair. <laughs> and anyway, so this scarred my brother. <laughs> he is now the editorial director of the New Yorker magazine. He's number two there. And, you know. I, I figured out why I can't get published. <laughs> oh well. Um, what I want to do tonight is I want to tell you a little bit about my writing career, which has been interesting and kind of rocky. And finally, I want to tell you stuff that I wish someone had told me when I was starting. So, my initial plan was to be a spy. So I was recruited at Yale because I spoke Russian, and then at the, later on at the Russian Research Center to the CIA. The problem was that I was a big Robert Ludlum fan. So I read The Born Identity and The Mattery Circle and all the Ludlum books. And I thought that working for the CIA meant they gave you a Glock, <laughs> fake passports, and a Swiss bank account, right? And I get there, and it's like, you're sitting at this cubicle over there translating Soviet economic journals from Russian to English. And I'm thinking, where's the clock? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can make this up and be much more interesting. So I really did decide it'd be a lot more fun to write a novel. But I did not have the guts to do it. I just thought, and I was a coward. And I wanted to write, and nonfiction seemed a lot easier to me. So, I was in graduate school one day, and I was, I was reading People magazine, which already shows you. I shouldn't read as hard as Russian newspaper. Uh, and People magazine had this article on a guy named Dr. Armand Hammer. And he was the CEO of Occidental Petroleum, and he was known as a friend of Lenin's. Interesting philanthropist, interesting guy. Um, a couple days later, I was reading the letters of Lenin in Russian, Page turner, please. <laughs> uh, and I found a letter from Lenin to comrade Armand Hammer. And when a Soviet leader called you comrade, that meant you were a member of the Communist Party. And I thought, man, there's a story here. And I did a little bit of research, and I found out that Dr. Armand Hammer's father was a founder of the American Communist Party, along with John Reed. And so anyway, I, I, got a, I got together a proposal for a book, but I didn't know how to get an agent. I didn't know how to get a publisher. I had no idea. So I was in Harvard Square in a bookstore there, and I read it. I saw, I saw a book, a biography of Walt Whitman, and it said in the back that the author, Justin Kaplan, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, lives in Cambridge. So I found his number in the phone book. I called him up and I said, hi, you don't know me, 
but I want to write a book and I have no idea what to do. Can you tell me what to do? <laughs> and to his credit, he said, sure. Wow. You know, come on over. And we, we talked about my book idea. He introduced me to his agent. All of a sudden, I had a book deal. Uh -huh. right. So I scored an interview with Dr. Armitage. So I was scheduled to talk to him for two hours. And about 15 or 20 minutes into my interview with him, I said, so tell me about your father's connection to Lenin. Your father was the founder of the American Communist Party, is that right? And Hammer stood up and said, all right, this interview is over. <laughs> and he kicked me out. Uh, and I thought, all right, whatever I just raised is clearly a sensitive issue for the man. Let's dig into it. <laughs> so I did. I, um, I got a, a, a tourist visa to the Soviet Union. I went to Moscow and did basically investigative journalism. And I found a guy who told me he was Armand Hammer's case officer in the KGB back in the 20s. It's called the NKGB, back in the 1920s. So here it is. I have this evidence that this guy, Armand Hammer, this big billionaire capitalist, used to work for the KGB. I got a call at my hotel room from someone in the KGB <laughs> telling me that Moscow did not believe in investigative journalism. <laughs> and whatever I was doing, I should stop it. Now. And I'm not going to think about leaving the country. Uh, but I said, okay. <laughs> so I did. So I get back to the US, I'm getting phone calls from executives at Occidental Petroleum telling me it's not a good idea to write what you're writing. The doctor is not happy about this. The doctor will sue you out of your socks. Now, I was living in Cambridge, Mass, in Central Square, in an apartment that rented for $245 a month. And I'm thinking, I got nothing. What's he gonna sue me for? Can I sue me for libel? He threatened my publisher with a libel suit. Uh, the book came out anyway, and what Hammer did was, he had his people around the country buy up as many copies of this book as they could. Oh All right? So the entire first printing was sold out. <laughs> I mean, this was what they call in publishing a clean sell through. <laughs> you know? Only they weren't printing anymore. So this was my first experience of writing a book. Now, understand, at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, you just went to Moscow. You basically uncovered the fact that a CEO, a billionaire, used to work for the KGB. You almost got thrown into the, the Bianca prison in Moscow. <laughs> you were afraid to write a novel. <laughs> so I thought, all right, you know what? Let's try it. I think for some reason, I thought of writing fiction as just running off a cliff and you wouldn't really know <clears throat> You think about the Wiley Coyote principles of physics. You know? <laughs> if you don't look down, you stay in the air, right? And I sort of thought, that's what it feels like writing a novel. I don't have the support of nonfiction. So what I did was I gave myself a deadline. I said, three years, see if you can learn how to write a thriller, write one, sell it. If not, do something else. So what I did was I read every great thriller I could get my hands on. Eric Ambler, John Le Carre, Graham Greene, and the whole range, Ken Follett, Robert Ludlum, the whole, the whole range of people. Um, and I made notes on what worked and what didn't work. So I was doing my own crime fiction academy. Um, so I needed an agent because my agent, the one who I got for my nonfiction book, retired. I needed an agent. So I sent it to this big name agent who represented Sidney Sheldon, remember him? Yeah. yeah. Really hot agent. So I sent him my manuscript. And a few weeks later, or maybe three, three months later or something, uh, I got it back with a note saying, thank you, but no thank you. So what I did was, I actually called up the agency and asked to talk to the guy. I said, I'm not calling to argue, but I would love to know why you didn't like this book. Just, if you could tell me, that would be great. 
He said, all right. And he spent about 45 minutes on the phone telling me what I was doing wrong. And I was taking notes. So I hung up and I decided to spend the next few months revising the book, which is what I did. And I sent it to him again. And he rejected it. <laughs> and I called him up again. And I said, so what did I miss? And he talked to me for about another half an hour or so. And then he said, but don't send it to me again. <laughs> so I then decided to send it to this really big name agent. I'm not going to tell you his name, because he's still in the business. But the manuscript was 900 pages long. It's a novel that eventually was published called The Moscow Club. So I sent it to this big name agent. And I get it back about a month later with a paper clip on page 55. And the note said, I stopped reading on page 55. If you haven't grabbed the reader by then, you're not going to sell a book. So I sent the exact same manuscript to another agent, who represented Robert Lowe, who called me up a week later and said, you know, I really like this book, but would you be willing to cut out the first 60 to, 50 to 80 pages? <laughs> I said, yeah, of course. Because you don't need it. It's prologue. You don't need that stuff. I said, all right. So this is the way I got an agent eventually, is through the process of rejection. And he made me revise the book. By the way, paperclip guy called me up after I hit the New York Times with this and said he wanted to discuss representation. And I said, you don't remember me, do you? <laughs> paperclip guy. <laughs> so that was a book called The Moscow Club which um, sold, the, I got a phone call from my agent telling me I'd sold it in the US and the UK for a lot of money, enabled me to quit my job teaching writing at Harvard. So I literally went into my boss's office the next day and said I quit. Yeah. I'll finish the semester, but I'm done. Um, that was, I fantasized about that. <laughs> got to do it. Yeah. Um, I wrote three novels after that, one of them, a, movie, a book called High Crimes was the main selection of the Book of the Month Club. It did okay, but in paperback it tanked. Now, I think the reason it tanked was because the cover sucked. But that's just a writer's point of view. What do I know? For who knows the reasons? So my agents called me in and said that the paperback did so poorly that we're not going to be able to sell the next book unless you are willing to write under a suit. So I, I did some ghost writing. I did some work for Hollywood. I thought long and hard about what I wanted to do. And I came up with this idea for a novel that was unlike anything I'd done before. So breaking all the rules that I'd been taught. For example, it was funny. The last agent had told me, Humor is bad for suspense. No humor in suspense. You know that's Tell that to Harlan Kilmer. Yeah. Um, it was funny. It was first person. It was a very human, emotional story. It was told from the point of view of a 26-year-old guy. And it was a thriller with not a drop of bloodshed. This is a book called Paranoia. My agent loved it and sent it to my publisher, you know, the one who had published High Crimes. And they turned it down. They said it was dull as dirt. And I sold it to the next bidder, St. Martin's Press, who believed this could be a bestseller. And they made it so. It was my first New York Times bestseller. And I got lucky. That book, High Crimes, got made into a movie. But this is a weird process to go through if you're a writer. A lot of people sell the book or option the book to Hollywood, and the truth is nothing ever happens. 99% of the time, a book is sold to Hollywood, and that's the end of it. That's, you cash your check, that's the end. Well, I got a call from my Hollywood agent saying, I think this, this movie's got to be made. We have a director who's interested in doing it, Carl Franklin. Uh, we have a deal at 20th Century Fox. He said, Ashley Judd wants to play the lead. Great. <laughs> Morgan Freeman wants to play the other lead. Okay. 
So let me know when this actually has happened, because I don't believe it's too good to be true. And so one day, the, my, my agent called and said, we have a green light. This movie is being made. Morgan Freeman, Ashley Judd, a guy named Jim Caviezel, who is now in CBS's person of interest, playing Ashley's husband. I was really good. And I said to my agent, okay, so can I have a cameo? <laughs> I'm the writer. <laughs> and my agent said, no, Joe, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> See, in Hollywood, on the totem pole, yeah, writers, writers are <laughs> underground. <laughs> you can't, I said, but you're Hitchcock. Hitchcock is, <laughs> you got, got cameos. Hitchcock was the director, Joe. All right, All right, well, tell him I would love to have a cameo. So a few weeks later, I got a call saying they started shooting and the director would like to give you a cameo in the jury, so that's, which is fine. You know, you know you're not going to make it to the screen if you're in the jury because they're going to pan over some of the jurors, but probably not you. The odds are probably not you. But that's okay. It would be a fun thing to be in this movie. I said, great. I said, you sound like there's a problem. What's the catch? He said, you're going to have to shave your head. <laughs> the marine high and tight. I said, I'll do it now. I'll, do it. I'll go to great cuts and do it now. And they said, no, no, they, they have to do it in makeup. So they flew me out there, and I met the director, and we talked for a bit. We agreed that I would be incognito on the set. He did not want people to know who I was. I said, okay. And he said, you know, you know, man, you've got a certain authority. I said, <laughs> he said, let's promote this guy. So on the spot promoted me to be the assistant prosecutor. So I got to sit in the front of the prosecutor's table next to the prosecutor, and my job was to glare at Morgan Freeman. <laughs> That's all I had to do. <laughs> you know, they didn't tell me how to do anything. I just glared at Morgan Freeman whenever possible. And I was in five scenes, five, five days of shooting. Now, imagine this. I'm in a courtroom that is exactly like the one I made up. So this thing that had existed only in my head, me sitting at a computer, now is on a sound set at 20th Century Fox with about 100 people working on this set, 500 people working on the movie, basically, and a few years ago, it was just little me and my little, little computer, my little imagination. It's the coolest thing. Um, there is a rule in Hollywood that if you work three days or more on a movie set, you have to join SAG, the Screen Actors Guild. So I worked for five days. Um, I got paid $1,000 to be a featured extra. And I had to join SAG for $1,500. <laughs> anyway, so I'm sitting there in the front table. I didn't know what to do. They just, I glare, they're glaring at Morgan Freeman. And um, before we started shooting, the guy playing the prosecutor turned to me and said, Hey, uh, I'm Mike. And I said, I'm Joe. He said, Where are you from, Joe? He said, Boston. I said, They flew you in from Boston for this part. <laughs> do you know someone? <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm really good at this. Um, he said, all right, Joe, so look, let me explain to you what high crimes is really all about. <laughs> <laughs> what your character is, what the interaction is, what, what it really means. And he began to describe this in a very intelligent way, for like five minutes. I finally said, Mike, excuse me, you're really good. I wrote high crimes. <laughs> I wrote writer, I wrote high crimes. Anyway, he stood up and said, Oh man, this guy wrote high crimes! <laughs> Morgan Ashley! So, you know, cover blown. Um, so, actually, later on, at the, during a break, I was tired of glaring at the other thing. I wanted to meet him. So I went up to him. Can I use blue language here? So I went up to him. <laughs> I went up to him and I said, excuse me. Uh, and he was standing there with his body double, who's also his assistant, a guy who looks a lot like him, same height, same hair, same complexion, the whole thing. 
He was sitting there talking, he was standing there talking to this guy, and I walked up to him and said, excuse me, uh, Mr. Freeman, I just wanted to meet you. My name is Joe Fender. I wrote the book that we were just based on. He kind of looks at me, he looks at his assistant, and he says, so this gentleman here wrote the book the movie's based on, like, I give a shit? Blood <laughs> 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 rushes to my head. Excuse me for trying to interrupt the movie star. And he said, ha, I got you. <laughs> yeah, you got me. <laughs> so he has a sense of humor. Um, so what I want to do now is tell you 10 random things I have learned along the way, which things that I wish someone had told me. Rejection can be useful. It's educational if you learn from it. That's how I got it. That's how I basically wrote my book is through the process of rejection. It can be a way of telling you you need to do more work, you need to do another draft. Or it can be a way of getting it to the right editor. The editor who actually wants that kind of book. So you can be turned down by ten agents in a row. That one agent who really gets it is the one who gets it. So rejection actually has these sort of cosmic uses as well. Number two, be stubborn, but be smart about it. Here's a little secret, which I don't think a lot of best-selling writers are going to tell you, that the most successful writers are not the most talented. They are the most stubborn, uh, the most persistent, but they have what I call smart persistence. They really are the ones who kept submitting to agents and didn't get discouraged by the first five or 10 rejections, kept learning from rejection. Every, every writer that I know has gone through this process of rejection. They don't talk about it. It's kind of painful and unpleasant, but it's an interesting, annealing part of the process. Number three, learn to value criticism. This is a hard one, because you know, you write this book and it's, you're really vulnerable. It's kind of a soft thing that could be harmed by any sharp, sharp objects. You know? You give it to someone to read, and you're holding your breath. And if you get if you get negative feedback, it's devastating. Well, over the process of doing what I'm doing, I have learned to really I'm kind of just masochistic about it. I learned to really value criticism because I realize it's sort of like when Hollywood does these focus groups where. They're making, the, they're making the movie more appealing to the audience by showing them, getting their response, getting their feedback. If I'm getting feedback from my wife or my brother, who my brother, the New York writer, does actually read my books now. He does. Uh, there's no hair stuff. <laughs> um, and um, I used to hate it, but now I really value criticism. It makes it stronger. Number four, the best fiction is about character, not um, the best thrillers are about people, about human moments, human relationships, and your plot should really arise organically from the characters. You know, we care about how Jack Reacher handles adversity, but we don't really care about the plot he's immersed in. You know, we think about Chandler, you know, we, most of his plots were, I think, overly complicated. But that's not what we're remembering when we read Chandler. Um, we remember Harry Bosch as a character. That's what sticks with us, not the murders that he saw. Number five, don't be afraid to do the risky, bold thing. You're already doing this risky, bold thing by writing a novel. So it's, it's OK to emulate your favorite writers. We all do that. We all start out by imitating. But don't be afraid to be original, to do something that's unlike everything else out there. You may meet resistance, but it'll pay off. And I know you that here, a couple of years ago, Nelson DeMille gave a talk. Nelson um, wrote a book called The Gold Coast, which his publisher didn't like and didn't want to publish. And it is, in my opinion, his best book. It really brought me to Nelson's books. It's fantastic. Um, Dennis Lehane wrote Mystic River. His publisher did not want to publish that book. He thought it was a mistake. Uh, in a much more humble way, 
my experience of writing the book Paranoia was like that, where I was doing something that was completely different, felt bold, um, and it paid off. One of my favorite novels of all time, Wrinkle in Time, by Madeline Engel, was rejected by 26 publishers because they thought sci-fi for kids, no one's going to buy this. <laughs> and you may know that <coughs> Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling's first Harry Potter book, was turned down by about 12 publishers in the UK who all thought a 500-page book about wizards, I don't think so. Finally, one editor took a chance on it, gave her an advance of $4,000 for Harry Potter, and printed 500 copies. Number six, and this is sort of more in the, 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 the narrative technique department, avoid the backstory dump. <laughs> this is something that I see in so many novice writers, where basically, we're going along, it's fine, and all of a sudden, boom, we get the backstory of the character. We get 20 pages <laughs> on who this character was and why he's there and how they came to be. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Do it as if you're watching a movie. Titrate it. Filigree it in. Give, it to, give the backstory in little bits and pieces, in action scenes, in dialogue, uh, in recollection, but make it brief. <clears throat> You'd be surprised at how little backstory you can actually give. Um, one of my, this is number seven now. Every scene must do some work. Why is it there? In the age of TV and the internet, readers do not have patience for scenes that aren't doing anything. I have a sign on my monitor that says, reverse, reveal, surprise. Every scene has got to do that. Reverse, reveal, surprise. Advance the plot, surprise us, reveal something, otherwise cut it out. I think of writing a novel as like telling a story to a kid or telling a story around a campfire. You learn really quickly to cut out the slow parts. The parts, as Elmer Leonard said, the parts that we just skip. <laughs> Number eight, never underestimate your readers. If you can see a twist coming, so can they. So surprise them, which means it's to surprise yourself. I think that readers are actually, readers of crime fiction are very smart. They tend to read a lot. They intuitively feel things and expect things. They know where stories are supposed to go. So fool them. Go the other direction. Uh, while I was writing Paranoia, about halfway through, this idea for an ending that was a complete shocker. And I thought, can this work? Yeah, I think it can. And I actually went back and I made some changes. And so the, the ending of the book occurred to me halfway through. And it turned out to be a terrific ending, the best one I've done, really. And it's a lot of fun because it so basically it surprised me as I was writing. Number nine, just write the damn thing. <laughs> you know, you've heard about the shitty draft, right? Don't get hung up on prose early on, or word choice, or grammar, or sentence structure. Leave that for the editing part. Do the crappy draft. You can't edit until you have a manuscript to edit. Hemingway said the first draft of anything is shit. The Russians have a proverb, the first pancake is always a lump. <laughs> And number 10, get lucky. I really think that luck is a part of this. You have to have the right agent, the right editor at the right time, and the right publishing house to, with a book that comes out at the right time of year, or get a movie made. Uh, a lot of things have to line up for a book to really succeed in a big way. But the only way to get lucky is by hanging out sort of being available for luck to be in, which I believe happens. So I'm going to stop there and take any kind of questions you guys have. <laughs>